So again, my name is Daryl Snake. Thanks for the invitation. I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist by training, uh, but I currently direct the peripheral nerve MRI program at Hospital for Special Surgery and also oversee MRI research there. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, so I just wanted to start off kind of the beginnings of MRI. The first paper, to my knowledge, that specifically addresses visualization of a peripheral nerve is a paper by Al and Filler, and is an image of, of the median nerve, um, actually, sorry, an image uh, in a rabbit of a nerve, I, I believe is a median nerve. Uh, and, uh, and then subsequently, that was in 1992, subsequently an article in the New York Times in 1993 uh, quoting Dr. Filler, uh, described how magnetic resonance can provide better images of nerves in the body. But when I routinely lecture to uh, residents and fellows and, and to other groups, I, I describe MR neurography as no man's land. And uh, Ross and I have had some kind of preliminary discussions back and forth. And I told him as a musculoskeletal radiologist, really never taught about peripheral nerves, maybe the sciatic nerve we look at, maybe the ulnar nerve of the cubital tunnel, uh, but really focusing for the most part on injuries of tendons, ligaments, and cartilage integrity. And as, as neuroradiologists, uh, my understanding is that it's predominantly focused in the central nervous system, maybe looking at the brachial plexus, the lumbosacral plexus, but not beyond. So it kind of falls uh, to the wayside, unfortunately. Um, but I'd like to describe some of the motivations, I think, for MR neurography and why it can be important. First of all, provide the global assessment of nerves and muscle, particularly muscle denervation, as shown on this image on the right. Uh, it's an important adjunct to electrodiagnostic testing, as been shown in many uh, papers. And it's particularly helpful as an adjunct to localize nerve injury. So often we know the nerve is injured. You know, the patient can tell you, my nerve is injured. Um, but the imaging and particularly neurography helps to localize the nerve injury, especially when it's multifocal or even particular in nature. And it's been shown to influence surgical planning and outcomes. Uh, so when we look at uh, nerves again, I'm not interested in only seeing the whole nerve, but kind of looking inside the nerve, looking at the individual particular bundles. Uh, so this is just a schematic of a group of nerve fascicles. Uh, within a particular bundle. And this is particularly uh, important, or this uh, arc to the anatomy is particularly important in the setting of an interinteropathic neuropathy. So in this patient who cannot uh, make the okay sign, she can't adequately flex her uh, FPL um, and her FEP index finger. And so these are MR neurography images uh, blown up, uh, admittedly, but I'm showing uh, with the arrows, the green, yellow, and red arrows, abnormal fascicles or particular bundles of the median nerve within the arm. So it shows here that not the entire median nerve, but only individual particular bundles are affected. And the, the uh, particular bundles that are affected, um, we can surmise as to which ones are affected based on this known topographical arrangement of the median nerve, where the anterior interosseous nerve bundle falls posteriorly or posterior immediately. FCR and pronator teres are more anterior, anterior medial, and the rest of the sensory and motor fibers of the median nerve are more lateral and anterior. And we look at longitudinal image of one of these particular bundles, we see multiple severe intrinsic constrictions, and we're able to map this out for the surgeon. These photographs are courtesy of Dr. Wolf here. You can see the markings on the skin where I've noted the different constrictions on MRI and where he's been able to uh, uh, identify them um, intraoperatively and, and perform neurolysis. And this patient did very well. Um, so with our improved techniques that I'll describe, um, we've kind of formalized the program and since 2016, I've kind of been monitoring our steady flow of cases and we now perform uh, with the exception of a blip uh, related to COVID, I will do approximately 100 cases uh, every month. And I have a, a special order uh, form uh, for the uh, physicians. So they're all coded um, in ethics. So that all the nerve cases, if somebody wants to interrogate a particular nerve, there's an order for nerve elbow, nerve form, et cetera. They'll go on to a particular protocol list. 
And um, this is extremely important because previously, you know, someone just ordered an MRI of the knee, a tension, the perineal, you know, perineal nerve, a foot drop, and it kind of gets lost in translation. This way, I'm able to protocol in advance, review the notes, et cetera. Just wanted to uh, touch upon ultrasound. Uh, the focus of my talk will be on MRI, um, but we routinely perform um, ultrasound of nerves at our institution. This is led by my colleague, Dr. Nawaka. And I made a chart here of kind of how I perceive um, how ultrasound and MRI um, are, are different in terms of what they can do, their capabilities, and how they complement each other. So first off, it's important to recognize that the contrast resolution with MRI is much, much greater than ultrasound. So on ultrasound, um, you're looking at subtleties of hypoecogenicity for the most part in um, injured nerves. With MRI, we have a much larger uh, contrast range. The spatial resolution is better for ultrasound, but that's only for very superficial nerves. As you uh, increase your depth, your spatial resolution is going to decrease. Um, I would argue that um, you know both uh, modalities are operator dependent. I think ultrasound, um, you know, one of the, the negatives that people talk about is operator dependent. But you know, with MRI too, you kind of have to know what you're looking for and how to uh, tailor the sequences. Certainly, MRI is much uh, more costly than ultrasound. Um, one important thing to note, uh, particularly in the brachial plexus, the ultrasound cannot visualize the T1 nerve root as it exits the foramen. So this is a so-called blind spot with ultrasound uh, that's obscured by uh, the, the uh, first rib. Um, and access to deeper nerves on ultrasound can be challenging, particularly segments of the axillary, uh, segments of the long thoracic nerve. Um, MRI is much more sensitive to motion. Now, ultrasound, you can obviously continue imaging. I can compare it to the other side. Um, and generally, ultrasound is easier to work around metal than with MRI. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so this is the team I work with. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, Dr. Tan, uh, who joined me uh, almost two years ago now from uh, the GE Global Research uh, team in upstate New York. Um, I work closely with Dr. Wolf, Lee, and Feinberg as part of our brachial plexus and traumatic nerve injury center, and then my radiology colleague, uh, Dr. Nawaka. Carol, a um, quick question about looking at muscle from, um, so the difference between ultrasound for muscle and MRI for muscle. Yeah. In terms of um, which ones, you know, sort of like the same table, but for muscle, what would you say for, for that? Uh, thanks for pointing that out. I got to add that to the table. Um, you know, I personally don't routinely do ultrasound myself. I focus on MRI, um, but I would say that um, MRI also similarly because of the better contrast resolution, uh, probably better able to pick up denervation. And speaking to the colleagues who do ultrasound, I think in, in particularly in cases of early denervation, the MRI tends to be more sensitive um, than ultrasound. Um, but certainly I know you can see, you know, you know, I know they routinely see denervated muscle on ultrasound, which is easier to pick up on MRI. Got it, thanks. Um, so when I think of, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, Ross asked me to talk about kind of how we form the image or some technical aspects. And I think there's multiple components of it. One are the gradients, uh, the magnet strength, uh, the, the coils, which are the hardware, the antennae that receive the signal and then software, both from the acquisition and reconstruction side. I think of these as puzzle pieces. They're all necessary to form um, a good image. So I'm gonna go into some details. On hardware, we routinely image at three Tesla. Um, and the reason we do is it inherently provides almost double the signal to noise ratio, 1.5T. And you can think of SNR's signal as a currency, which you can use to either acquire higher spatial resolution, which is what I currently do, or it can image faster because you don't have to acquire um, the data as much as you would at 1.5 T to get adequate signal. Um, these are the surface coils. If any of you have had an MRI before, you, you know that for whether it's the brain or an extremity, there's a coil that you either fit into or wrapped around. And just to note on the coils, the coils I think are as critical as kind of the pulse sequences that we're running. Um, 
because the closer the coils are to the skin surface and the, the better that they conform to the shape of the, the neck and shoulder, which are difficult to conform to, the better the signal that's picked up. Um, so in terms of software, uh, so the pulse sequences you run are typically two-dimensional fast-spin echo sequences, and these are very good for looking at the internal particular architecture. So they're acquiring them usually in high in-plane resolution of about 0.3 to 0.5 millimeters, um, sometimes even higher resolution. Uh, they're heavily T2-weighted and fast-suppressed, and we can sometimes accelerate them. Um, and the importance of T2-weighting is, is that it can highlight nerve pathology, essentially edema, and the fat suppression kind of resets the dynamic contrast range and increases the conspicuity of an abnormal nerve relative to a normal nerve or maybe an abnormal particular bundle. Um, we use 3D imaging, um, but only as an adjunct. It's not part of a routine protocol. Um, I think 3D imaging can be helpful because we can get higher through plane resolution. So it means that the slices are much thinner, they're about one millimeter, and we can obtain them isotropically. And because they're obtained isotropically, or the fact that if you think of the voxel as a cube, the dimensions are, are equal in all three planes, we can then reconstruct them into arbitrary planes. And I find it particularly helpful when communicating or discussing a case with my surgical colleague to kind of show him or her in one image kind of an abnormality along the course of a nerve. And then we use some advanced reconstruction techniques to denoise, uh, to, to bring up the SNR, to blur the sequences uh, using AI and deep learning methods. So you, you say there's um, sort of operator dependency. Um, is this part of what the operator dependency is in terms of what hardware, surface coil, software? Yeah, so, use? yeah. Um, no, I think, I mean, yes. I, <laughs> So part of the operator dependency is kind of, you know, we have a step protocol in place, um, but during the exam, um, while this is not very efficient, I check every single case. So after one or two sequences are acquired, I ask the technologist uh, to call me. And usually on my monitor, I look at the case and I'm looking for abnormalities maybe that are not suspected, maybe muscle denervation that can point me to interrogate a particular nerve where I'll obtain maybe slightly different um, planes to delineate pathology. So that's what I mean in terms of operator dependent, being able to maybe obtain different planes of imaging or adjust the protocol slightly. So it's not essentially plug and play where a patient, you know, ideally that, that, that would be great. You know, a patient goes into the magnet, the technology, we have a set protocol, they quit, press start, they run the whole protocol, which is typically what's done for musculoskeletal imaging or imaging of the knee or shoulder. Here, um, I'm often adding a particular sequence or adjusting the sequence to delineate the pathology better. Okay. <clears throat> so what's the, what's the variability between centers that, that uh, you're aware of in terms of, of what the quality of the coils are and, and the software used? And yeah. is that something we should be aware of? Because yeah. I work at several uh, facilities, so I'm, I'm always seeing different quality of images. Right. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, the beauty or the, I feel very lucky kind of to work, work where I work is because we have a kind of one place, we have 10 magnets in the, our main facility, and we do have other satellite mag, um, places with magnets who kind of control all the protocols at all the, all the places and we homogenize them. And I get all my nerve cases usually onto two or three magnets. So they're kind of very standardized in very large institutions, such as the ones you're working at, sometimes the protocols, um, and your radiologist can speak to this, but there might be different protocols at different places. So one is you want to try to homogenize protocols across the different magnet centers. Um, and then two is kind of, you know, optimize the protocols, make sure that using the, the same coils or the, the best coils that are available um, each and every time, and then a lot of it comes down to education of the technologists. Um, our technologists overall are extremely savvy. Um, they're very good, but at the same time, I routinely you know, give them kind of in-services to kind of uh, review nerve anatomy, or if I'm making adjustments to the protocol, I review those protocol changes as opposed to just putting them in and, and then they don't really know what's going on. Okay, and the expensive part of it would be the, the coils? If, if uh, something needed changing? 
yeah, the coils uh, could be very uh, expensive, but usually that's you know part of the budget of an of an imaging department. Um, you know, the coils I use for the most part are product coils that you likely have uh, that in your magnet. Um, sometimes, for example, the setup I'm showing here on the bottom left, the brachial plexus, these are coils that we had that were pre-existing. I was just for several years, I think around, these coils are really not made for this region, as you can imagine. They're really optimized for the nerve, uh, sorry, for the knee and the hip. Um, and for the elbow, they come in large, medium, and small sizes. And I just decided to put them on the neck. And um, there is a, a small, or it used to be a small research component that would allow me to uh, combine these coils together. So again, you probably have the coils um, there. Um, it's just a matter of you know ensuring that the technologists actually use them. Having Sorry, said I... that, my team and I work uh, both with um, a uh, engineer, a Cornell electrical engineer, uh, who are in the process of trying to develop a better cervical spine and brachial plexus coil. I've worked extensively with GE in the past to develop two prototypes. Um, they kind of put that work aside uh, preliminarily. But in general, there is a deficiency, I think, in the market in terms of a good brachial plexus coil. It's something that uh, Dr. Cannon, who's on the call, and I are kind of actively working on trying to improve the around the, the is, it, is it unreasonable to expect the, the smaller smaller kind of community hospitals to to be able to do this sort of stuff or is it something where you can I could potentially ask I, I don't think it's unreasonable um, I think it's best to probably at least in the very beginning try to do all the nerve imaging at one okay. or three two places um, that way you have the same technologist working on the scan um, you know, I think as this gets more complex, and, and I think it will, um, for good reason, you know, you can think of it similarly as cardiac imaging. I don't think it's, you know, not, not nearly the same complexity as cardiac imaging, but if you might be familiar with cardiac imaging, the patients come to a special place, usually have fellows who are sitting at the magnet with the technologist overseeing it for an hour or two. So I think in the, in the very beginning, it's probably best to bring uh, patients for nerve imaging to the main hospital, not to do it at the community center. So I should probably refer everyone to Dr. Beckett and uh, start from there. <laughs> that's, that sounds good. I, I'm sure Dr. Beckett is raising both hands. Um, <laughs> hopefully, no. yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. So you know, I spoke, I think, about uh, kind of 2D imaging. And the 2D imaging, we, I harp on um, obtaining or orthogonal uh, slices. So that means that we're getting slices perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the nerve. And in my mind, these are the most critical images to properly evaluate a particular detail. Um, another technique I use in the brachial and the lumbosacral plexi are vascular suppression techniques. And these are just to suppress slow flowing veins that sound nerve visualization, um, in addition to the fat suppression and PT weighting techniques. Let me go over why kind of we need each of these techniques. So on the left here is a proton density weighted image. This is kind of our workhorse of musculoskeletal imaging as sort of the highest signal to noise ratio of any type of pulse sequence. Um, but you see on the right, a T2 weighted sequence at an echo time of about 80 milliseconds, we're better able to delineate the nerves relative to the background tissue in the muscle. Again, T2 weighting is needed for to, to delineate the nerve contrast relative to the muscle. And then we also need fat suppression as well to bring out the, the nerves. Um, these are just showing with T2 weighting, it's not only important to visualize the nerve, on the left here, an image of someone partially in a turner, constriction of the suprascapular nerve, but also we use T2 weighting to look for denervation edema here with involvement of the supraspinatus, infraspinatus muscles on the right. So normal muscle T2 is approximately 35 milliseconds. For denervated muscle T2, at least in the, uh, act, in the, the acute, subacute stage, but even longer stages, it's usually uh, elevated and be as high as 80 milliseconds or even higher. Um, so in terms of fat suppression, um, Ross, I know this is something that you wanted me to address as well, and I think it's an extremely important topic. Um, this is a nice review article, or the chart below is from a review article in Radiographics. 
any of these different types of fast suppression techniques. But um, I've just focused on the stir sequence. So this is, you might be familiar, at least if there's neuro neurologists on the call, might be familiar with flare on the brain to suppress CSF. So stir is simply another type of diversion technique to suppress fat. Um, but more commonly, we use, at least in our 2D technique, the Dixon uh, technique, where we obtain two different echoes, um, and they're kind of combined in a mathematical equation to create what are called water images, or these fat suppressed affluent sensitive mm -hmm. images. And the Dixon technique, um, I, I really like because it provides robust fat suppression and much higher signal-to-noise ratio than the stir sequence. Uh, so vascular suppression, one technique I use is giving gadolinium with an inversion pulse. So here on the left is a pre-contrast image. Admittedly, it's a MIP or maximum intensity projection. And you see a lot of these images, um, at least I see in the literature, um, you know, some of them are beautiful images, but there's a lot of contamination, if you will, in the background by veins. So here, if we give gadolinium, the post-contrast sequence to the same patient, now we're able to suppress all these both flowing veins, get in a MIP, and then nicely delineate the suprascapular nerve. There's another example, 40-year-old woman, she uh, had left superior gluteal nerve symptoms. Um, the nerve looked normal, but here you, we can't see the superior gluteal nerve on the left because it's contaminated or obscured by the left superior gluteal vein. And following contrast, we can nicely see the left superior gluteal nerve. Is that something we should be uh, doing, is ordering with, with contrast? Um, that's something I would discuss with the radiologist. Uh, I often, <laughs> I like to, you know, when I'm asked, I like to have the option of the radiologist. Um, because I check each scan, I don't always have to give contrast. Um, for example, I can often see the axillary nerve pretty well without contrast. Uh, but if there are cases in which I'm focusing on the suprascapular nerve and I can't see it well in the free contrast sequence, then I find the post contrast helpful. Right. Ross, this is Tehran. Um, we, we routinely do contrast and great. then uh, post contrast stir imaging. Perfect. That's great. I'll be sending some over. <laughs> uh, so, one other technique that uh, I've kind of tested and published on is using respiratory triggering. Now, respiratory triggering um, can be achieved with a bellows. This is nothing new. It comes with every magnet, just a band you uh, put around the waist and it, the machine will trigger during an expiration. Um, but I found this helpful, particularly in evaluating the infraclavicular plexus where it's adjacent to the lungs. So in this example, see this purple nerve sheet tumor is well seen on the respiratory triggered image, but it's almost completely obscured, obscured um, due to respiratory motion artifact when it's not triggered. So this comes with a time penalty, um, but particularly if a patient's respiratory rate is very regular and their rhythm is not too slow, I find it very helpful. Um, another technique we use on occasion, uh, particularly when there's a lot of metal, is MSI, a multispectral imaging technique. On uh, the GE systems, we have Navrix and Siemens, we have CMAX. Uh, but here, a patient with total shoulder arthroplasty, the, the supervisors to the day always question, do they, did you really want to put the patient on three Tesla? Uh, they have a total shoulder arthroplasty, or maybe they have a total hip arthroplasty. And I say, yes. And they said, are you sure? I say, yes, and this is why. Because here we can clearly see the plexus adjacent to the, the metal. So for the total shard of the plasty with the clavicular plate, et cetera, I still almost insist that the patient go on free Tesla because of the higher signal-to-noise ratio. And using either specialized metal artifact production techniques or just modifying um, some of the um, you know, the, the bandwidth particularly, we're able to image around metal. Uh, so lastly, in terms of the, the puzzle pieces that we speak of is the reconstruction side. Um, so we use a deep learning based image reconstruction for 2D imaging, that's product on our, on our G systems. But here, the prototype on 3D imaging, so here in the brachial plexus, it's annoying and really able to sharpen, crisp up the, the images to delineate the extrafamilar roots. Here's an example of two patients, top and bottom, of uh, median neuropathies, so the median nerve is in the arm. 
And you can see in the column on the right, you're able to see the, the um, abnormal um, appearance of these particular bundles of the median nerve much more sharply on the images on the right that were reconstructed using this um, AI reconstruction as compared to the standard of care reconstruction on the left. So also now kind of putting all these puzzle pieces together, um, I think the, the brachial plexus region uh, nicely shows how these pieces come together. So here's an example of starting looking at the, um, the rootlet in the cervical region. This is using uh, a prototype coil. Um, I, no, I no longer use, but it was a coil that I, that I had um, used, um, developed with GE. And here, this is uh, called a cosmic sequence or balanced SSFP sequence, nicely delineating the, the, the nerve rootlets and the, the nerve roots. And then here, these are uh, just 3D uh, stir sequences. So we're starting anteriorly, the thyroid gland, able to delineate the terminal branches nicely, the muscular cutaneous nerve, division towards radial nerve, suprascapular nerve. And this was actually several years ago in a volunteer. This was the first time I was able to really see the long thoracic nerve in the purple along the chest wall nicely. And then on thin slice imaging, you can nicely see the extra pyramidal roots. This is the C5 and C6 contributions to the long thoracic nerve. As we go distally, pick up the suprascapular nerve immediately coming off the upper trunk. And the other trunk, here's the C7 contribution to the long thoracic nerve. And here's a kind of early formation of the cords. So I'm going to now talk about interpretation. Um, happy to ask, answer any questions if there are before I continue. Just for um, diffusion imaging, DWI, um, and any thoughts on? Yeah, I'm going to, um, Ross, if I, I should be able to touch on that toward the end of my talk. OK. So interpretation, oh, yeah. Got a question. How long are the patients in the scanner for uh, the, the good sequences? <laughs> um, so so say for per sequence? Total. Total, total time. Total time. Total time is extremely variable. You know, if it's just a cubital tunnel syndrome, then I often it'll just get two axials. It could be 10 to, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. Whereas a complex brachial plexus exam, traumatic plexus exam, can go on beyond an hour if I want to look for uh, nerve root avulsion, look yeah. at the, you know, the brachial plexus proper, maybe there's stretch injury of the musculocutaneous nerve distally. So yeah. kind of variable in case by case basis. And, and for the for the full traumatic brachial plexus evaluation, where you're doing the root avulsions and you're doing the plexus and so forth, yeah. are you bringing them out and swapping out coils or are you doing it all with one coil? Right, so ideally, do it all with one coil. Um, and that's kind of what I'm working toward, uh, not having to swap out coils. But if you're looking for root avulsions, and typically we don't use MRI for that, I still think of CT myelography as a gold standard. Typically, the surgeons are ordering a CT myelography. But if I'm asked to look for both the root avulsions, that's a separate coil setup compared to the brachial plexus, is a separate coil setup. And then if there's any question of any distal injury, say beyond the mid arm, then the patient would have to come out again and swap coils. So that's, you know, you bring up a very good point. I would say that's one of the inefficiencies of MRI um, is the need to swap out uh, coils. Are, are you, did you just say that you do trust your myelography more than your MR for root avulsions? Yes. The CT myelography, the, it, you know, we're obtaining CT is typically 0.625 millimeters cubed. So it's, um, it, it, it isotropic, so it's a higher spatial resolution if we look at it on the voxel size compared to the um, MRI. And the MR myelography, while I do, you know, again, I do run the sequences sometimes, I find it less reliable because it's often degraded by motion. Whereas in CT myelography, you know, it's typically not as motion degraded. So I think the standard of care, unfortunately, you know, still to this day, it's teaching myelography for looking at nerve with this. I, I have to say, I've, I've been trusting our MRs over our CT myelography, but I have to say, I, I feel like our center here is doing our myelography with a little less uh, interest and detail than your guys are. 
you know, yeah. pictures that I, that I think are, you know, fuzzier and in less, less definition than what we're getting on the nice, you know, cosmic. And, uh, okay. I mean, cause I, you know, I mean, I think obviously I haven't seen the, the images uh, that you have there, but I know you yeah. often see on CT myelography is that, you know, you might have only the ventral rootlets out or maybe only the dorsal rootlet where we see only partial rootlet motion. So I feel we get much finer detail. We're able to see maybe only one or two rootlets of the whole ventral rootlet group out. There's a lot of partial injuries uh, that, you know, the, that, that I've seen. The more and more uh, we do this, that I think are harder to tease out on MRI. Okay. okay. So just in terms of in interpretation, maybe I'll go relatively quickly through this. Um, but one for a normal nerve, particularly when it's not monofascicular, it's polyfascicular, we're going to look at this honeycomb pattern arrangement. And longitudinal axis, the nerve is big enough, you can often see the intraneural fat um, inter interwoven or kind of interleaved with the different fascicular bundles on a longitudinal plane. You have like a coarse hair appearance. And we also look at the you know, fat around the nerve to make sure that it's intact. This example of the ulnar nerve at the elbow. Secondly, normal nerves on our traditional uh, proton density uh, sequences, which we actually run a slightly higher uh, echo times than the, than the traditional uh, PD sequence for more fluid sensitivity. Um, the nerves, both on the, the proton density, I'll just use that term for now, and our nerdictin sequences are iso to usually more mildly hyperintense relative to muscle. So that's the normal nerve, the median nerve in the, in the carpal tunnel. Um, then we'll, obviously we look for nerve continuity. So this example, 36 year old woman with a history of laceration by glass. Unfortunately, she not only lacerated her Achilles tendon, but also this adjacent sural nerve. This is, uh, you know, one of the things I've been focusing more on over the last four years or so is really the course of the nerve being able to pick up um, pathologic changes that I think I, I, my eyes weren't as attuned to um, earlier on in my career. The 10 year old girl trampoline fall with both bone forearm fracture, she had a median neuropathy. So these are axial images through the forearm, it's proximal to the fracture site, here's the median nerve showing where the radius is. All of a sudden the median nerve seems to deviate from its expected course dorsally towards the bone. And then on this last image here, this is distal to the fracture site. So this is an example of median nerve tethering. Um, Ross, I promise you I'll talk a little bit more about diffusion in a moment, but this is an example of a tractography image of the uh, median nerve tethered to the bone. And the uh, patient was operated on, see the tethering, detethering, and she did very well, four months post-release, now able to uh, close her hand. This is another example, 39-year-old right hand dominant male, uh, 19 months post arthroscopic tegel repair. Uh, if there are any orthopedic, orthopedic surgeons in the audience, the arthroscopic, arthroscopic repair of the Hegel is kind of controversial. Uh, but anyways, performed at an outside hospital. They should present it with a dense left axillary nerve palsy. And this is uh, a curved MPR image of his axillary nerve. And if you notice, the nerve or the axillary nerve seems to take a hairpin loop towards the glenohumeral joint. Looks a little funny, at least in my mind, compared to the normal nerve on the left, which continues nice into the quadrilateral space. So here, normal on the left and abnormal on the right. And these um, intraop photographs, courtesy of Dr. Wolf, show that the axillary trunk here was far to the subscap, and he was able to identify a suture that was tethering the, the nerve um, to actually the, the suture anchor that had caught the nerve to, uh, to the glenoid bone. Uh, so for nerves, we look at the size patient uh, with CIDP, probably very familiar with. Uh, this is diffusely a large thickening of the nerve in a traumatic stretch injury. This is a patient that we see very commonly, often we're not, Im we're not imaging them for this, re this underlying condition, but they have charcoal and retooth and they're coming in for um, some type of correction procedure. Can I ask you a, a quick question about um, if you're not, because there's myelin 
a lot of myelin in nerves, especially in CMT, I guess. Yeah. Um, if you're fat suppressing um, versus not fat suppressing, can you see the quantitation of the of the fat or the, the, the myelin? Is that a similar signal? Um, might be, but the myelin, I think, is on a microscopic level. So, you know, these things the, the are not sensitive, even if we had, even if we didn't suppress the fat, we wouldn't be able to see the myelin. We'd have to do myelin specific sequences, uh, which we okay. can currently run to try to quantify or visualize the myelin. So, if you're looking at a, a regenerating nerve and, and you can see myelin kind of forming down the nerve, there's, there may be some way of, of, of looking at the myelin uh, lost distally and, and you can see it moving along. In theory, in theory, yeah. But, yeah. I don't know, if Dr. Chan's on the call, might be more familiar with myelin imaging. You know, I know it's done in the brain, but um, I, I haven't seen that much in the, in the periphery, people doing myelin imaging. If I yeah. you wanted to comment. I think that for myelin, you have to use some other kind of um, myelin sensitive technique um, to detect that. Yeah. Okay. So this is a patient. Um, you can see erosive changes in the posterior aspect of the lateral condyle and plateau seem to resolve five years later. But we noticed enlargement of the nerves. Uh, this patient had known amyloidosis. We surmised that that was the reason for the enlargement of the nerves, although so this wasn't uh, biopsy proven. Um, this is also, unfortunately, a very common uh, entity of image. The patient with, you can see they're missing a limb, marking their large nerves, so there's a stump neuroma. Um, and then, you know, one of the most important things, again, when I evaluate nerves is to really look at that particular architecture. Um, this is a case I showed previous, previously in my presentation, patient median neuropathy of sudden onset. And here, this particular architecture um, you could argue that it's preserved, although the, the fascicles themselves look markedly abnormal. Maybe we're seeing thickened uh, epidurium around the particular bundle. There, with this case, where we see a partial neuroma of the median nerve where we've got a loss of particular architecture. And I would argue that the clinical history is also very important to differentiate between neuroma versus um, uh, non neuroma. These are examples of intrinsic processes of the nerves, so two types of peripheral nerve sheet tumors, fibroma, schwannoma. There's again just a tractography image. Um, I would say it's more eye candy uh, than anything. Uh, we don't really use this in clinical practice. Um, this is an example of a ganglion cyst within the tarsal tunnel, um, expressing medial plantar nerve, patient with tarsal tunnel syndrome. My um, experience is an extremely, extremely rare entity. So we're often asked to image it. Uh, rarely, rarely see a ganglion cyst. The most common reason I see tarsal tunnel syndrome is because the patient has been operated on for tarsal tunnel syndrome, and there's an isogenic injury of the nerve. Um, so then sometimes there's some entities that can be um, difficult to determine whether it's an extrinsic or extrinsic process or it's a combination of the two. This is a 27-year-old man with recent onset foot drop, the imaging of the knee. He had prior surgery for the same condition. Um, sorry, the arrows are actually a bit off. But here we see this cystic mass around the common perineal nerve. And it's intimately associated with the proximal hip fib joint. This, um, this coronal MIP image, we see the ganglion cyst arising from the articular branch of the common perineal nerve to the approximate tip tip joint. Um, so here's the surgical scar. Um, here are intraoperative images. I said in the deep and superficial branches of the comparineal nerve. Here's the articular branch. You might be very familiar with this entity, an entity an intraneural ganglion cyst, but it can have extra neural components as well. And the previous surgeon had not resected that articular stalk. That's thought to be necessary to avoid recurrence So I'm going to kind of finish off, and hopefully this is a lead-in. Um, Ross, please stop me uh, for one more time. But, you know, I think of um, neurography, it probably should be called neuromuscular imaging, um, because I think the muscle is so critical, um, particularly when we're evaluating motor or mixed motor and, motor and sensory nerves on um, the evaluation. So here's an example of generated muscle. 
usually think of it as an acute subacute stage. The pair on the left, the muscle is still bright, but it's markedly atrophied, um, reduced in bulk, and it can undergo fatty replacement in the chronic stage. So this is in a patient who had a lymph node biopsy, iatrogenic injury of the spinal accessory nerve. How quickly do the muscle changes come on? So when you go acute, subacute, chronic, what? Yeah. How, how, what, what resolution can you kind of be confident about in terms of the time? Yeah, great question. So I, in the anecdotally, the patients I've imaged who have had a transected nerve within say 24 to 48 hours, I'm often not able to pick up uh, denervation of the muscle. Um, so I think the earliest on MRI that I see it is probably later, probably corresponds to maybe the earliest you see it on EMG, um, which would maybe be you know week to ten days in terms of picking up the edema pattern. Um, although, if you look in the literature and animal studies, they say that they can see edema in as early as 24 to 48 hours. Um, in terms of fatty replacement, um, you know we typically don't see significant fatty replacement until about six months down the road. Um, although, you know, I think it can happen, early, happen earlier, uh, you know, probably a continuum. Um, and, you know, it's one of the kind of targets of the research that Akun and I are doing is to try to quantify um, those changes and see if we can pick them up earlier and just qualitatively. Do you think those, uh, can you quantify the, the receptivity of muscle, do you think, with the fatty replacement? Is there any biomarker that you can see there? I'm not sure if I follow your question, Ross. Sorry, uh, for the, so if you've got a denovated, so yeah, so one of the internal discussions we have a lot is um, the, op, the, the window of opportunity for re muscle. Right. So if there's a signal within the muscle that suggests that you can't re it because it's gone beyond a certain point, a threshold right. of fatty replacement or, or whatever it is, it, it would be a, a useful target. Yeah. I, I mean, so let, let me actually, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll finish. I was going to discuss some of the partial turn research, but let me um, divert to kind of the research we're doing on muscle. Um, These are just cases of constrictions. I'm happy to talk to you guys another time, but we'll take the time. I think I didn't get through it. Um, so we're, let's go to muscle. Hopefully this will answer your question, Ron. Um, yeah, so let's, let me talk, is that okay, Ross, a little bit? And then we can discuss in terms of what we're, tr we're trying to look at, uh, Xun and I are trying to look at basically three parameters that we um, hope will kind of detect overall muscle health. health. One is increases in T2 in denervation. So this is from the literature here. You see that there are increases in T1 and T2 values. However, the percentage of water in the denervated muscle does not really change. It's the amount of the extracellular fluid that really changes. So we're trying to quantify that by performing T2 mapping, which is a quantitative technique. Um, secondly, um, looking at the literature, we noticed that the muscle fiber diameter typically decreased, it, it decreases in, in denervated muscles. So in this table here, again, from the literature, normal controls, the mean uh, muscle fiber diameter is 53 and denervated muscle in this human population is decreased down to 48. And then lastly, another quantitative marker trying to look at is the fat fraction increase. So we can quantify the, the percentage fat in the muscle. Um, so this, this is kind of what we propose, and this is what we're doing both in the, the existing NIH study I have looking at partial Turner syndrome patients, but in many peripheral neuropathy patients, we're looking at uh, T2 mapping values, fat fraction, and using the diffusion technique, uh, we're trying to estimate the muscle fiber diameter. So this is one paper recently published. It was just a pilot study. Um, we compared qualitative assessment of muscle denervation by a radiologist looking at uh, the signal intensity, mild, moderate, severe, and, and comparing that to how well it agreed with grades of uh, muscle motor unit recruitment on EMG compared to T2 mapping values. And so for both readers, the agreement between EMG and T2 values was higher um, than compared to the correlation between EMG and a qualitative assessment. This kind of has motivated us to continue looking at T2 mapping and muscle for denervation 
and being able to differentiate uh, uh, different grades for your improvement. For diffusion um, imaging, um, the, the pixel that, or the, uh, the spatial resolution we're currently able to acquire is on the order of two by two millimeters. Um, unfortunately though, and Ross, hopefully this will answer your question, the external diameter um, is on the order, uh, sorry, we get a two by two millimeter pixel, which gives us sensitivity about 10 to 20 micro, 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 micrometers, but the external di the diameter is smaller than this, about one micrometer. So we think on uh, um, three Tesla currently, we do not have good sensitivity um, to look at nerves using diffusion um, imaging. However, with muscle, the fiber diameter is on the order of 50 to 100 micrometers. And so we believe that we do have adequate sensitivity to interrogate muscle. And that's why since next soon, I, I spend many long nights at my hospital trying to play around with diffusion imaging and peripheral nerves. And actually, Aksun and I had collaborated previously before he came here. But since he's come here, we really focused on muscle um, because I think we, we, uh, I realized at least, and I think Aksun has showed me that we have adequate sensitivity for muscle, but not really for nerves. Um, so this is one, I might be able to end here. Um, this is one uh, 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 biomarker, if you will, or a parameter that um, we're trying to derive and invalidate. Um, and this is so-called apparent fiber diameter. And using this diffusion technique, um, we're able to um, predict kind of what the muscle fiber diameter is. And this is a study we recently submitted under review. Um, so kind of uh, prelim data, we show that the apparent fiber diameter derived by this diffusion MRI technique in denervated muscle is markedly decreased as compared to control muscles as well as actually to non denervated muscles in patients. So that was the non denervated muscle is 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 neuropraxia. No, the non denervated muscle is just simply muscle that is not in the distribution of the nerve that's involved. For example, in a patient with supraspinal neuropathy, the denervated muscle will obviously be the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. But we've looked at the other regional muscles, for example, the deltoid, and we've noticed changes um, in their diffusion parameters as well. Whether this is, you know, due to compensation in the muscle and the muscle fiber diameter changes, um, you know, maybe increased strain pattern of the muscle, um, changing the, you know, yeah. the micro environment. Um, we're, we're not seeing the seeing the same thing on uh, on impedance myography. I think a similar kind of. Um, not sure whether it's they're not using the limb, so there's some um, right. stuff. Um, okay. Um, so that's really all I have. I think it may be more useful for all of us as a group. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys have a hard stop at nine, but um, you know, I'm happy to discuss further or take any questions. That was great. No, that's exactly what we're looking for. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, no, I think Dr. Brown has someone in the operating room. Is that right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> so, yeah, I do so there, there's a bit of a hard stop at nine there. Somebody but, uh, gave, I've been running in and out here. So I, I, didn't, I didn't catch everything, but uh, uh, we would probably love to use you as a resource as we come across complex issues from time to time. Um, but uh, it, so, so I, I, I'm having a hard time getting over